First of all, welcome everyone to our webinar. We are happy to say that we had many people registered to attend and it is great to see so many of you here with us today. Uh, before we go any further, we just want to remind everyone that as note noted when you enter today's session, the webinar is being recorded. Um, so if you do not wish to be recorded, uh, we recommend that you exit the session now. My name is Melissa Velvelfare and I will be your moderator along with Andrew Lepani from our team up today. Uh, just a little bit on myself, about myself. Uh, once again, my name is Melissa Velvelfare. I am I'm from Vanuatu and I currently work for the Vanuatu Cricket Association. Uh, I've been working in sport for the last four years and I'm very passionate about women's sport and helping using sport as a tool for development, especially uh, for women um, and people in the vulnerable groups in our communities. And that's a little bit about myself. I will hand over to Andrew to give us a brief introduction about himself before we get, get uh, going. Thanks, Melissa, and hi, everyone. Extremely appreciative to be part of today's webinar and uh, to be co-hosting alongside Melissa. As mentioned, my name is Andrew Lapani, and I'm the Partnerships Manager for Team Up. It's an Australian government program supporting partnerships across Asia Pacific so that people of all, um, all people can realize their full potential through sport. I'm from and currently based here in Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea, where I've worked for the National Olympic Committee and the United Nations Development Program, and I've played football for our national team as well. Having gone through the sport for sustainable development MOOC as part of the first intake, I'm really keen to, to hear um, today's conversation. So I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you very much, Andrew, for, uh, for introducing yourself. Um, we would like to acknowledge that many of us are working from home today, uh, and we will do our best to navigate any connectivity issues that arise throughout the session. However, we appreciate your patience with this, and we would also like to ask that we keep out for everyone to keep the microphones mute uh, while our guest speakers and our panelists are speaking uh, today. We, we are here today to raise awareness on the second edition of the Sport for Sustainable Development, uh, Designing Effective Policies and Programs Massive Open Online Course, or MOOC, uh, which launched on 10th May and is now open to learners. Uh, throughout the 90, 90 minutes, you will hear from speakers across the Pacific, uh, including Lua Rickies, who is uh, an athlete and sustainable development goals champion from Papua New Guinea, uh, Sainimili Saukuru, who is the Oceania Sports Education Program Coordinator with Oceania National Olympic Committee, Mr. Henry Tavoa, the Director of Youth Development and Sport with the Vanuatu Government, uh, Dr. Catherine Raw, who is the ac Academic Cause Advisor, Sport Development, uh, School of Health Sciences with Western Sydney University, Rekha Day, who is the Senior Partnerships Advisor with you are India and uh, Huyong, who is a child fund sport for development team leader in Vietnam, and they will all be sharing their experiences of the course with us today. We are delighted to begin with a brief message from Ben Howard, who is the program manager with Team Up, the Australian Government Sport for Development Program in the Pacific in, in Asia Pacific, and one of the Sport for Sustainable Development uh, Move Steering Group members and chair of the International Platform on, on Sport and Development Steering Board. Thank you, Ben. Uh, thanks, Melissa. Uh, I'd also like to warmly welcome everyone to our webinar today, and great to see so many people, particularly across the Asia Pacific, but also other parts of the world join us as well. Uh, the Sport for Sustainable Development MOOC was launched in July 2020. The first run of the course attracted over 3,400 learners, from across 165 countries and six continents. Accessible free online, the course has been designed to cater to a wide variety of learners, including practitioners, students, athletes, government officials, sport organizations, board members, intergovernmental organizations, public policy experts, private sector and civil society organizations. Now, based on feedback from the first run, 62% of learners surveyed indicated they have already applied the information, tools and resources from the course in their policies, programs and projects, meaning that the course is having a real world impact on sport and development, both in the Asia Pacific region and globally. 96% of learners surveyed indicated that the course met or exceeded expectations, while 92% said they were satisfied with the course. These numbers are extremely exciting and show that the course is seen as a valuable tool for a wide ranging audience. 
one of the things we were very conscious of when putting together this course was that people could see themselves in the course wherever they were in the world. And I'm really proud of all the Asia and Pacific talent that we have featured in this course. Although we've had an overwhelmingly positive feedback on the course, we wanted to provide a platform and opportunities for individuals to share their first-hand experience of the course so that you can see how this course could benefit you. We're very excited to be joined by, today by an all-star lineup from across Asia Pacific who are looking forward to speaking with you. And thank you again for taking the time to join us today and we hope you enjoy the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben, and some impressive statistics from the first run of the course. And it's uh, great to know that since the opening of the second run of the course on May 10th, over 1,179 people have already registered for this second run. So we're getting close to the 5,000 person mark of people who have registered to take the MOOC over the two intakes. And hopefully those of you on today's webinar who haven't yet registered will add to that total. So today's session, you will hear from each of our speakers as they share their perspectives of the course and highlight enhancements made for the second one. And throughout the webinar, people, uh, please pop any questions you have into the chat box and following our discussion, we will open the floor to those questions and try to answer some of them. But before we get started, just a gentle reminder for everyone to keep the microphone on mute throughout the presentation so we can all hear the speakers clearly. Thanks in advance for the self-regulation on that front. So, uh, turning to our panel, and we'll start with Saina Mili. Uh, Saina Mili, can you explain why you think the course, courses like the Sport for Sustainable Development MOOC are important, and what value you think they bring to young people um, working in sport and individuals working in sport organizations in the Pacific and in Asia? Mm. Uh, thank you, Andrew. I mean, I'm just looking at the, the names, Mo, uh, almost everyone, I think it's 100%, they're all uh, working in sport. So I'll probably address that uh, the group first. Um, for me, the way I look at this course, it's, it's a good time for, for those of us working in sport. To, you know, it's a great chance for us to just stop. Uh, we reflect on you know, uh, looking at this course, how we've been doing stuff, how we've been carrying out our roles. Um, and then you just start to make a decision, you know, the things that you need to stop doing, things that you need to continue doing, and maybe things that you need to start doing. Um, and so if you're involved, whether you um, are advising board members, uh, this is an opportunity to, um, to influence policy by learning how you design uh, uh, policies, um, the linking policies with how you design your programs. Um, and, and also like, cause with a lot of uh, financial resources invested in, uh, in sport, uh, you can learn here how to better account for it, how to um, measure the programs that you do so that um, you know you can uh, showcase the changes that have happened in the community um, so I believe um, you know uh, for those that are probably officers development officers managing programs on the ground uh, this is probably a good way for you to learn uh, new ways of doing things you know how you plan how you can engage partners how you can monitor and evaluate your programs and most of all to measure the change eh? Um, so this will really help reshape the programs that uh, you know, we currently uh, implement. I think for those, uh, maybe for the um, listeners uh, that's in the forum, uh, probably to advise those that would like to work in sport, um, understanding that in sport, uh, these two, uh, two things I like to think of is uh, sport, the, the work that we do, it's about program design and project management. Uh, so a lot of tools that are in this uh, course will really help in it. You know, proven best practice tools. Um, you you get to learn how to identify problems, uh, how you um, conduct situational analysis, identifying people that you work with, those around you, who you need to talk to. So these are tools that um, that can really help you reduce, you know, those. Um, uh, challenges that you will you know could encounter on the way if you don't uh, use these tools um, and also it's a really good um, um, addition to your curriculum vitae or your resume um, you know having uh, employed and being involved in recruiting education officers in the Pacific you know I would put this as one of the top uh, skills um, when I'm looking out for someone to be engaged in the program um, so um, so and then my final comment would be, uh, uh, 
you know, whether you're working in sport for development or sport development, the tools that you use here are generic and you can use it anywhere. Uh, if you decide to, you know, move into another area, not in sport, these tools you can use uh, when you move across. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Millie. I think uh, you've touched on a couple of the tools and the value of those tools that are included in the course. And we'll be talking about the course content with some of the other panel members shortly. Um, but just with regards to the course, it is available uh, free and online. So why do you think that's important for um, people looking to take these type of courses? <clears throat> I think for um, in seeing a lot of uh, Pacific Islanders in the group, and I'm, I'm sure it, it'll be uh, very similar in other nations of the world, uh, sport in the Pacific has generally been seen as something that you do because you are a former athlete, uh, you know, your family were involved. And so we, we just bring our experiences uh, working in sport. Um, and this is unlike, you know, other industries that you work in. You, know, you have to be a doctor, you know, a nurse or a teacher. You need qualifications. Uh, so from ONOC, the organization that I work for, you know, it's, it's invested heavily in the um, sport education program called OSEP. And the idea was to just bring about uh, readily available, accessible causes to our people across the 15 Pacific Islands. Um, so, you know, it gives our people an opportunity to get some formal qualification. Uh, but with the cause online, you know, it gives a, a chance for our people to, um, to do the causes at their own pace, um, you know, at their leisure. Um, you know, it's um, something that, uh, you know, it'll reach more people, you know, that cannot attend the causes and, um, you know, and, and free, you know, so they don't have to dig deep into their pockets, eh? but I think they still need to buy data and probably a phone to, to, do, this, uh, to do this online cause. Um, so having this available, you know, it, it gives our people an opportunity to, uh, you know, professional develop themselves. It's free, it's online. Because I believe a, a time or a season is coming where um, online courses will become the norm and then you will have to start charging. Um, so this is something that, you know, encourage our people to, um, you know, to sign up and do the course because it's um, highly recommended. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Sina Mealy, for, uh, for answering that. And, uh, as you've rightly, rightfully stated, the course definitely being free for all will allow a lot of uh, people who are passionate in sport to learn skills and also develop uh, academic abilities and understanding and how to go, go about, about sports. And we'll now move to uh, Catherine, uh, Dr. Raw. Uh, from, from an ac academic perspective, can you share with us why you think this course is uh, valuable for students and potentially academics seeking to gain uh, better understanding of sport development? Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Um, I think one of the most important things, as Millie alluded to, is this course is really accessible. Um, so not only does it benefit me as an academic because it's a free teaching tool for my students, um, it helps me uh, to provide a supplementary free resource that the students can use to reinforce their learnings from their degree um, and, and refresh their learning along the way. So it has a really nice compact nature to it um, and it's a real nice summary of some of the things we teach in a uh, bachelor degree in sport development. So students aren't just learning about the positive impacts of sport, many of which they'd already be aware, aware of, but it's reinforcing the idea that sport isn't automatically good. There's actually some challenges and risks in there and if you implement these programs particularly in vulnerable communities you can do more harm than good so it's quite important that we're moving beyond these ad hoc throw a sport in there and it will automatically do good we need to move beyond those sorts of ideas um, and actually get some qualifications and some learning and education out there into the field not just for students doing degrees but for the broader sport development community I think it's really important get those tools out there get those frameworks out there um, so that they can be applied in these settings and that people can increase uh, the chances of doing good and reduce the risks of doing any harm. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you, Catherine. I think that's a, that's a very valid point to consider as well. Uh, thinking about sport in the Pacific and Asia, Asia Pacific, um, a lot of people who work in sport have, uh, do not have academic qualifications and are therefore doing 
uh, support for development programs by trial and error. So it's nice that there, there is an academic perspective to it now where we can take sport forward. And, and, and saying that, Henry, uh, working as part of a government ministry, um, can you explain what value uh, the Sport for Sustainable Development MOOC brings to government officials and policymakers? Sorry, I'm just going to direct my question to Henry again. Uh, yes. He's unmuted yes. now. Uh, just uh, from your experience working as part of a government ministry, can you explain the value that uh, the Sport for Sustainable Development MOOC brings to government officials and policy makers? Just, just in one word, having been uh, also involved in the Nambanga Sport Project back, back uh, into over 10 years now, where we, we had that uh, Sport for Development program, we called it Nambanga. Uh, ben uh, knows about that one. But uh, being involved in that, the, the, the advantage that stood out for us, especially coming from a sports development uh, perspective at that time, was that um, sport for development brings a, uh, an added benefit in the sense that it provides, provides ways that we could measure the impact of sport, not only in the competition sense, but also in the, in the health sector, for example. Um, we have uh, in the islands where we had that uh, pro uh, programs running the islands, we had um, people being uh, uh, participants being uh, uh, having their uh, blood uh, blood sugar tested, having their uh, 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 pressure uh, taken, uh, uh, and and not only that, but the communities themselves uh, getting them together. That was also part of the uh, part of that, that particular uh, program. Uh, for sports for development that we have had so so uh, taking that forward uh, it does does bring value into that because it makes it it gave us it gave us uh, policy makers and, and government it gave us that um, that other perspective of sport not only for sport but also sport that could develop uh, the community develop not only the individual but the community in the sense of uh, uh, their health their uh, Education. It did provide also training for young youth um, leaders to 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 be able to um, uh, be trained uh, in leadership roles as far as the uh, 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 sport for development programs in their communities were concerned, uh, Melissa. So that uh, helped the government to see that particular aspect uh, side, that particular side of uh, sport for development. Thank you, Henry. Um, in, Vanu in Vanuatu, the youth population uh, makes up almost more than 50% of the total population of the country, and that would uh, be similar to other countries in uh, Asia, Asia-Pacific countries. Um, how would you encourage learners, particularly young people, to apply learnings from the course in their day-to-day -day work? Yes, I think the first, um, the first thing would be to be an example myself, um, uh, and I've done that, I've, I've registered already. And I did, I did say that uh, uh, sharing this with as wide as possible uh, to as many youth as possible, uh, given the position that my, I have, I hold now as the director of uh, uh, the Department of Youth Development and Sport, uh, that, that would be the initial, uh, the initial uh, uh, application I would do to the learnings uh, in this position that I currently hold. So yeah. Um, that is basically the first steps that I would uh, take, uh, Melissa. Thank you. I, you've mentioned that you have registered for uh, the course yourself. How have you applied uh, the learnings in your role as the Director of Youth Development and Sport with the Vanuatu Government? Yeah, uh, uh, coming into this position myself, uh, I, I, I must say that um, the as you as you already alluded to the, the population of Vanuatu is predominantly youth, uh, and that has been the um, challenge that we face, and especially in regards to giving youth opportunity. So, uh, this is definitely an opportunity for youth education and training. Now, uh, sport because sport is not a we are not we are volunteers mostly in sports uh, in our in our participation in sports uh, that that has made youth uh, participate in sports a little bit and more on the work, for example, more on the education uh, and 
this this, this learning that one of the main things what that would that has uh, will be an application from this learning is that uh, it it will give them an opportunity to find time to make time anywhere uh, anytime with this internet connection to be able to uh, utilize this as an opportunity for them to to grow their capacity to to know more and understand more about uh, sport not only sport but also um, the 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 career the pathways uh, as a whole. Thank you very much, Henry. Great to have you uh, share on how you feel the course can help um, Vanuatu and, and the national policy for youth development and sport in your country. And, and also great to hear you say that you're going to be promoting the course with all the youth in Vanuatu. Um, just a reminder to everyone on the, on the webinar that we have been populating the chat box with links to each of our speakers um, so you can learn more about the work they're doing. So the course has been designed to help learners explore aspects of program design and implementation and to understand how to measure the impact of policies and programs. Uh, Rick, if I can turn to you now and ask, drawing on your experience as a practitioner in India, can you explain why you think these components are important for support for development programs? Thanks, Andrew. Um, I have been working in the support for development sector for more than a decade and my experience is that sport by its, its own nature uh, it certainly promotes participation, but participation alone does not necessarily uh, ensure positive development outcomes in the society, in the community where you're working. It is therefore critical to understand that the aspects of program design, delivery, monitoring, regular monitoring, uh, based on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a scientific basis, uh, and measuring impact not only helps achieve better outcomes uh, for the program, uh, but it also supports policy makers uh, because we are able to provide the right evidence on the effectiveness of sport on development. Uh, it is therefore essential to, uh, to go through a structured process and uh, support uh, the program delivery with the right information. And, uh, uh, and that helps you through the program. And when you, when you discuss that through your advocacy efforts with the state governments or with the, uh, uh, with the central government, uh, as in my case, I have been uh, heavily advocating uh, uh, development of uh, uh, support for development uh, with the central government as well as the state governments where I have been working. And uh, it's of course a long, uh, it, it takes a long while, but uh, yes, there is much more receptance uh, uh, to this now than what I was experiencing maybe 10 years ago. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Rick. It sounds like um, you're experiencing some great outcomes with the programs that you're involved in. Um, you touched on the areas of program design, implementation, measuring the impact of policy and programs. Would you consider these areas to be fundamental building blocks to a successful sport for development program? Uh, yes, very much. Uh, look to understand and analyze and organizations. You know, we have a theory of change, which we develop over a period of time because it's all based on the needs assessment of a particular community. And then you, uh, you design what change will bring better and positive outcomes. And uh, in, that, in, uh, in that process, if a structured approach uh, is taken, uh, it supports in driving that positive change to take place. Uh, and it's also uh, supportive in terms of uh, the time that we are looking at. Maybe in three years, we are able to bring a certain kind of uh, uh, great positive outcome, or it might take longer or, or it might take shorter, but it helps you to go through your own program. Uh, in this process, uh, uh, now, uh, if it is monitored and documented, a sport for development program can bring far reaching outcomes than just being an engagement intervention. Uh, as an example, I can I, uh, the organization uh, uh, to whom I am I am giving my my advisory services, which is called Yuva India, an NGO based in the tribal state of Jharkhand. Uh, it started as just a program of of football with a small group of girls, and uh, it's we have traveled a long way, uh, wherein uh, wherein the the processes that we have used uh, to analyze our own uh, our own program has actually helped. Uh, in, uh, in, 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 in bringing uh, the outcomes at the community level, at, the, at, uh, at advocacy platforms, and in influencing the government. So certainly the, uh, the, the outcomes are just far reaching. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Rick, and, and uh, congratulations again on the, the impact that you has had um, in your region. 
Um, you shared your thoughts on, on the building blocks, and I know that the MOOC covers um, these building blocks and allows learners to walk through that process, as you said, developing a theory of change and understanding those different aspects um, with regards to programming. Um, so uh, thank you once again for, for that insight. As I'm sure we all agree, I support for any effort done in the name of development to understand their link with the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. Uh, the sport for Sustainable Development course also helps learners understand how sport can contribute to the SDGs. Um, Lua, turning to you now, as an athlete and an athlete representative and in your role as an SDG champion with the Papua New Guinea Olympic Committee, can you share your thoughts on how sport can be used to advocate and, and promote the SDGs? Yes, um, thank you, Andrew, and welcome everyone to, to this webinar. Um, so as an SDG, like Andrew mentioned, my name is Lua Rikis. I'm from Papua New Guinea. I'm part of the um, Papua New Guinea Athletes Commission. I'm the deputy chair, and I'm also um, an SDG champion. So that's one of the champions for the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, my goal or the goal that I champion is goal number six, which is clean water and sanitation. And from my experience growing up playing netball and, you know, moving on to elite level, um, the facilities that we had in, in um, where we play sport, we didn't have running water. We didn't have uh, a clean and safe, uh, you know, place to go and um, believe ourselves. So just, you know, after retiring from sport and getting into this work, I thought this is a goal that, you know, relates to me. And um, this sort of situation is experienced across the country. So you have uh, sporting facilities that are available um, that lots of people attend or turn up to, uh, but you don't have these basic facilities available. So you don't have, a, you don't have clean water or even um, um, sanitation facilities there. So, with this absence of, with the absence of these facilities, um, advocating to um, uh, associations, um, especially Nepal associations, of, of the on the importance of having these facilities when they're organizing competition was was my way of advocating on um, you know the sustainable development goals and um, for our you know Nepalists to understand that this is how we can contribute. If we want to run an uh, run a competition, we need to make sure that we have these facilities available so women can come knowing that um, they, there's a place that they can go and you know clean up after they compete. Uh, there's a place that they can go and relieve themselves when they need to. So, um, and this is especially important um, when women are experiencing their menstruation. So, um, as an elite athlete or former elite athlete, that's how I advocated, especially for this goal, uh, making sure that people understood that, especially those that organize competition, that in order for, you know, to encourage more women and girls to participate in your sport, um, or even ev everyone in general, you need to have these facilities. Um, and I think because of the lack of these facilities, you find that a lot of women and girls drop out of sports at the age of 15, when they, especially when they're experiencing their menstruation, they find that um, they don't feel comfortable going to the sporting area because, you know, they can't manage their menstruation in a uh, safe and dignified way. So, yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Luan. And thanks for sharing your experiences um, advocating for the SDGs and especially SDG 6. Um, in Papua New Guinea and in, within your sport. Um, you mentioned that you drew on uh, your, your history as an athlete and your experience as an athlete um, when choosing to, to advocate for SDG 6. What role do you feel athletes can play in helping to promote the SDG agenda, um, both uh, within their communities and at a national level, but also regionally? I think it's, it's important to find uh, something that you're passionate about. So I think because, um, you know, this SDG, clean water and sanitation, it, you know, it, it, it affects a lot of women. It's the responsibility of women to ensure that um, you have clean water. So it's a, it's a burden falls on women to uh, make sure that there's water in the house or the place, the, the home is clean. Um, and I thought because as a mother, um, I you know, was drawn to that SDG and, you know, I find that I could, I could easily go and advocate that on the importance of having uh, clean water and also making sure that these sanitation facilities, um, they're there, but they also need to be clean and safe. So women, um, whether they're participating in sports or whether going to the market or at school, um, are comfortable and know that you know, there's somewhere that they can go and relieve themselves. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lua, for sharing your experiences and for the work that you do um, as an athlete to 
champion the SDGs to achieve clean water and sanitation for women and for, you know, and trying to create safe, safe and accommodating and accessible environment for women to be able to um, enjoy sport and participate and become successful athletes in sport. Um, now, this brings us to the concepts of the course introduces. Um, the course introduces learners to a variety of key, uh, key concepts on sport uh, and gender equality, disability, human rights, social inclusion, peace building and safeguarding. Uh, we'll now get back, go back to Rekha. Uh, Rekha, can you explain why you think this is important uh, and share with us how one example, one example of how your organization is using sport to influence uh, one of these key areas in gender equality, human rights and peace building? Uh, thanks, Melissa. Uh, Yuba India uh, caters to uh, uh, to tribal girls in the state called Jharkhand, which is based in the eastern part of India. Uh, it started, as I said, uh, as a very small intervention with uh, uh, with uh, with the founder interacting uh, with a group of uh, very small group of girls who were uh, who who he thought was were interested in playing football. And that uh, drew attention from a lot of girls from the same village and the nearby villages, and the numbers started growing. Uh, it's, it, it took about two to three years to give a shape to the program and realize that there is just so much potential uh, if sport is introduced in a community where, uh, 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 which, which is, which is uh, uh, for people who don't know, Jharkhand is also a, a, a state where uh, the rates of child marriage uh, uh, and human trafficking is high. Uh, literacy rates are very low, especially for, for women. Uh, so girls were, were attracted. Uh, it served as, a, as the right hook uh, to connect with them and bring them to the football field and then also uh, share uh, and, uh, and, and discuss the importance of education in their lives. The program, as it developed in 2015, Yuva started its first school. And uh, the whole purpose was to, uh, to, to support completion, not just enrollment. Because uh, if you see in developing countries, we, talk, we, we have started talking about 100% enrol enrollment. Uh, but unfortunately, the dropouts rates are very high by the time children reach to the grade eight. Uh, therefore, the focus of the program was to, was to support, give all possible uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the right environment so that girls uh, are motivated to complete their school education. And that was linked to a college preparatory kind of a program wherein you are prepared to go to the university uh, and further pursue education. Uh, that has been a, 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 a fantastic journey. And, uh, and uh, we have managed to uh, place every girl with uh, the right kind of competence which, and talent which they have. Uh, with uh, the best universities in India and abroad. Uh, the most recently, the first uh, child of Yuva uh, qualified last month for, uh, for the Harvard University, and, that's, and that was one of the biggest achievements which Yuva India made. And uh, we made it to the news uh, in India. Uh, a lot of, lot of uh, uh, newspapers covered us. Uh, that's because it's very unimaginable for the kind of community where, where the kids belong uh, to where alcoholism rate is high and uh, as i said uh, rate of completion of school is very low uh, a child uh, completing and not just completing uh, 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 reaching to uh, to uh, a reputed institution like harvard has is 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 really an effort and of course that has that has been a 12 year journey uh, and therefore sport can do just wonders, but it has to be really a structured approach. And if you follow it, and if you if you if you uh, bring in the right tools, uh, which 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 MOOC addresses, uh, you can really uh, build a very good and highly effective program in the community that gives the right results, and especially in context to bringing gender equality. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Rekha. Uh, now, building on the example provided by Rekha uh, Huion, could you also share with us one example of how your organization is using sport to influence safeguarding or social inclusion? Thank you, Melissa. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to join today from Vietnam. My name is Huion and I'm the Trifun Sport for Development team leader in Vietnam. Um, the work Trifun Sport for Development has been involved over the past 10 years has demonstrated that safeguarding is essential to equitable sport. 
Child Family Support, Sport Federation and Partner to learn about and to implement the UNICEF LEAD International Safeguard for Children in Sport as the guide to process toward uh, good practice of safeguarding. Partner and Federation and Communities-Based Club are supported to uh, complete their annual self-assessment about their current safeguarding practice and use the data to de develop and improve their policy commitment and application to ensure that the key safeguarding uh, criteria is implemented effectively at every level of the organization's work. And uh, training, advice, and support are provided to partner organizations on an ongoing basis. And they have reported that this support has helped their organization to deal with the, the safeguarding concerns reported through the system. And uh, it's essential that they have strong safeguarding reporting system in place to identify, report, and, and respond to any concerns for someone's safety. Additionally, Partner has reported that this support has them to engage and re retain more girls and women in sport. In our experience in Vietnam, for example, when the girls and women and the community duty barrier feel the sport and the activity and the team are safe, they will allow and support their daughters, sister or their wife to participate and having a safeguarding policy and system to, to manage safeguarding concern and to minimize risks is one of the way to accomplish this. But communicating this commitment with the parent and community member is critical to achieve a good social inclusion practice. And Child Fund uh, Sport for Development support them to be able to evidence the step they have taken to implement their uh, policy commitment and the number of girls and women participating in Child Fund Sport for Development supported activity with our partners is more than 50% in all locations with the majority of key leadership role at the our coach, uh, coordinator and team leader held by women. And lastly, having a policy and ongoing monitoring and uh, evaluation of the policy application has helped the partner to secure more funding and resources from sponsor and donor uh, who are increasingly looking for the level of risk management to be uh, in place. Uh, thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Huyong, and thank you for stressing the importance of safe safeguarding policies and uh, why it's important to have them in place. And I think both your example and examples from uh, Reka approve of that and have, uh, you know, outlined clearly why it's important to have safeguarding policies because that allows us to be able to use our sports to uh, make a difference and you are doing that at the moment. Um, a lot of the participants who participated in the course uh, felt, felt that the course have, has um, filled in a, is starting to fill in a, a, a crucial gap and it's highlighting, highlighting the crucial gap in sport and development. Um, we'll go to Catherine now. Catherine, can you share with us your, your perspective on this? Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Um, so I guess what's really important here is um, even though sport for development has effect, effectively existed in an informal sense since the 80s and, and the real momentum uh, around it kicked off around the turn of the millennium. We're only really now seeing students getting formal, uh, formal university degrees coming through that have been catered around sport development and specifically sport for development, like the one that I teach. Um, so the graduates from those, those degrees are only just starting to hit the workforce now. Um, so while we've had a few researchers and stuff, in terms of an educated workforce that have been trained specifically in this area from the get-go, um, yeah, they're only just coming into effect and into the workforce now. And then on top of that, what's really obvious here is not everyone, particularly in this field, has access to a university degree. Um, so it's really important that we're getting free resources out there like this online course for people to access because it's uh, helping to engage with and deepen the knowledge base of those that are already engaged and working in the field. Um, and then, as I alluded to before, it's providing an additional resource for students who are studying this area um, to re reinforce their understanding and then refresh the learnings of graduates um, that have recently graduated or have graduated from somewhat relevant degrees like sport management but want to start refining and working their way into sport for development specifically. 
So I think what's really cool about this course is it integrates uh, learning from, you know, the academic and research sector, which I work in, as well as those that work in pol the policy sector um, and practical settings as well. So it's promoting discussion between all of those groups, which is really important when you're working in such an international and collaborative space. Um, and when you actually click onto the modules, there's um, a discussion board beneath it. Um, so it's really cool that it's promoting discussion between those. Um, and that's really relevant, particularly in the on well, online world that we're currently living with COVID and everything. Thanks. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I think that's, you've just outlined something, what, what's really great about the course. And uh, I do have to agree on that, that, you know, having, having a, uh, an acad academic perspective to it and also having experiences from uh, people around the world who are working in the spot and development sector is also, is also great. And I, I'm definitely looking forward to where sport is heading um, with this course. And, you know, ahead of the second run, the course has been comprehensively assessed in order to improve and enhance uh, its components. And uh, this includes soliciting feedback from an ex expert uh, reference group and through a learn survey. Uh, and based on the feedback, a dedicated component related to sport and COVID-19 has been included, um, which includes uh, guidance and resources. Kuyong, we'll, get, we'll come back to you now. Can you just explain why you think this is important and how it will increase the overall relevance of the course? Um, yes, it's essentially important to understand the impact that COVID outbreak has had in the communities and our sport for development work. So for sport for development work, COVID-19 has brought ongoing disruption. We have uh, adapted our programming between three different modules from we call it uh, Reconnect Rapid, Reconnect Teams and Pacific to adjust to the realities and ensure that we are just not waiting for the time when sport can regain. Because if we are just waiting for sport to regain, we lose the chance for the network benefits from sport and the life skin content to be relevant for young people and children in rapidly changing uh, situation in the community. And by sport, uh, we, we can uh, think about sport can be central to recovery and be able to adapt uh, we did in the past year and continue to adapt to the merging situation this year. It's also essential as part for development sector that we adapt to the new reality and create strategy and build in supporting mechanism that take into account the challenges that uh, different gender are facing. So in our experience, we have had many coaches existed uh, our work during the COVID outbreak to find uh, other higher paying work, but more boys and men existed in the program since the COVID-19 started. Because the male coaches, they are, uh, they were experiencing more financial uh, pressure in this situation and they, and we are still working on how to engage them uh, because once the coach exists, we lost big investment on them. And additionally, the program will look less attractive for other boys and men in the community looking on, uh, looking from the outside in terms of coach recruitment in the future. And on the other hand, this has represented a big opportunity for sport for development work to increase our engagement with girls and women in rural community who has limited participation and income earning opportunity in addition to farming and housework responsibility. Um, for under the COVID-19 outbreak, we saw that an increasing level of stress and anxiety was mentioned by most of the responders and um, the, the family member may lose their work. It means that concern about food, uh, money for food, for education and, and to uh, afford their life basic uh, necessities are often cause family tension and thus the rates of domestic violence has increased during the COVID-19 and under this circumstance uh, it is a priority for, for us to uh, reactive and remain our safeguarding network to deal with the increased risk of the of, um, violence based on, because of the lockdown and I think that all 
all of the reasons above are important and relevant to the component about sport and COVID-19 as the COVID-19 is going to happen again in the future and it's not um, easy just to solve in the next few years. So it means that it will continue uh, creating big impact in our planning, in our sponsorship, in our partnership and, and especially on our beneficiary, uh, the local youth and children. And um, the cost, I believe that it will have fun for people to know more about this impact and, and have them to think more about how to adapt and reflect this impact into the project design and policy evocation. Um, thank you, Melissa, over to you. Thank you, Huang, and uh, thank you for, uh, for explaining why you think this is important and how it will increase the overall relevance of the course. Um, in addition to a dedicated component on sport and COVID-19, cross-cutting issues such as human rights, gender and safeguarding have also been enhanced. Uh, Henry, over to you now. Could you share why you feel these additions are important, not only for practitioners and sports organisations, but also for intergovernmental organisations, government ministries and civil society organisations? Let me just uh, state uh, that sport is, is a uh, cross-cutting issue. Uh, and um, and from the experiences that we've had as as uh, in in Vanuatu, we've seen we've seen sport we've seen sport uh, play in 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 uh, tourism. That that is that is uh, something that is, is has observed well, was observed has been observed uh, regularly when we hosting competitions, uh, and we've seen sport play in health. Uh, Vanuatu has a high uh, high incidences of uh, NCD uh, uh, and uh, the partnerships with the Ministry of Health is, is critical as far as the uh, uh, sport is concerned. Um, uh, in education, of course, uh, through the um, through physical education, through the national school games uh, that we have had over the years, uh, and also we've seen we've seen sport play uh, and. Well, sport does have a, 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 a um, sport does have a part to play in climate change, as far as a country being being a disaster-prone country in the sense of earthquakes and and and, uh, uh, and the um, uh, cyclones uh, that we have had. Uh, there there uh, there have been movements of people from island to island, from area to area. And that requires them to be physically fit, and uh, sport does and has a potential to contribute in that in that particular sector as far as preparedness for disaster is concerned. Uh, as far as uh, as far as uh, 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 gender is concerned, we have had uh, active uh, in active promotion in in enabling women uh, to 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 find their place in in and through sports. Uh, uh, well, one example. Is you, um, uh, Melissa, uh, and also we've we've also seen that um, some sports that have been predominantly male sports, uh, football, for example, uh, cricket, uh, have introduced the um, uh, have introduced the women's uh, women's uh, sport not only at the senior level but also in the junior levels. So we've seen that across across many male dominated sports where there's been now a breakdown and realizing that. Um, uh, uh, women and girls to have a part to play in these in, in these uh, previously uh, male male dominated sports, uh, such as um, uh, to go back again as far as the uh, cross cutting issues of sports, uh, we we would like to see, and that is uh, something that probably this particular um, should I say MOOC would would help us contribute to is that the uh, Physical education. Uh, we would like to know, and see, and hear from uh, those that have and will and plan to uh, have MOOC integrated into their physical education curriculum uh, uh, in the coming days or or, or, or months uh, or, or years, uh, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Uh, now, in addition to enhancing the overall learner experience. The second round also includes 
increased signposting to key initiatives, uh, resources and tools, including other courses. Signing me Lee. Can you share why this is important for learners? Um, thanks, Melissa. Uh, well, I think, you know, all of us have seen how, um, how the current global situation has, uh, has really, um, you know, caused us to like go online and uh, using technology. So, you know, this cause uh, and uh, being signposted to all these uh, different areas is important because, you know, we, when we go online and we just access the whole world, you know, there's an opportunity for us to make connections. We start building networks, uh, you know, and for us in the Pacific Islands, I really like to encourage our people that you need to showcase the uniqueness that we have. Uh, because while we learn from others, we also should be sharing, um, you know, what we have to offer. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, like I, you know, being a former athlete is, you know, like our coaches, eh? they, they are the ones that help us discover what we, you know, think that we didn't have. Um, so I would see like doing these courses, they're, they're like a coach. When you, when you do these courses, you discover, oh, okay, uh, you know, there's some other areas, some other things that I've not thought of, you know, have never thought of. So this is how these courses, um, uh, you know, help us discover that there are things out there that I could learn from and I could apply it uh, to what I'm doing. Uh, and because generally, you know, life, life is, is that. It's a continuous learning, it's improvement. Uh, and doing such causes, you know, help you um, uh, to become better in what you do. So these, uh, uh, this signposting is, is really helpful. Uh, you know, another thing that, uh, you know, in life is that, um, you know, for, for those that have done formal education, it's, uh, it's important that, uh, you know, we take ownership of our growth. And one of them is, you know, either being mentored by someone or doing such online courses. And I think my, probably my last comment here is uh, you know, just an encouragement to the general uh, population. You know, I, I like reading John Maxwell's book. He's one of uh, you know, leadership gurus in the world. Um, one of his uh, <clears throat> 15 invaluable laws of growth. Uh, you know, it talks about the law of intentionality. And so it basically says that growth does not happen. You know, life is about being intentional and doing things on purpose. So, you know, what, what we believe, you know, is not best said in words, but it's shown in the choices we make, um, you know, in, in the next 10 years, the choices we make will, will, will shape our life. You know, so everything worthwhile is uphill. Uh, you know, you have uphill dreams, but also you have downhill habits. And so being intentional, you know, if you want to accomplish anything in life, you know, you, we have got to be intentional. So, you know, like, so just doing this cause, you know, like those downhill habits will say, uh, you know, I don't have time, you know, I don't have a computer, I don't have data, you know, I got so many things to do. Those are downhill battles, you know, so if we have a dream to contribute to sport, you know, to influence, you know, our youth population into, into influencing our children, or if you, you know, you want to stay in sport for the rest of your life, then you need to sign up, you know, start and sign up today, be intentional. Thank you, Melissa. Vinaka, Vinaka Vakalevu, thank you, Saina Milik, for those uh, comments. Some great advice there and a strong reminder to sign up to the course. And also a reminder uh, to our participants to please add any questions you have to the chat box, and we will be getting to, to them shortly. So thanks to Zheng for, for popping in a question just now in the chat box. So, so far we've spent time hearing about the course. Uh, so how about we now spend some time showing what the course actually looks like. Um, in the chat box, we are going to shortly put in uh, a link to the course, and that link um, will provide you, if you click on it, will provide you access to the course. So you can either go um, online and view the course there, or you can follow, as I believe it's now on, yep, it's now on the screen, our shared screen, exactly where uh, the course is if, if you click on the link. Um, so this demonstration will help you see what the course looks like and we'll walk through how to sign up and register for the course. But don't worry if uh, you fall a bit behind or we move too fast because we will be sharing a sign up poster after this webinar um, that will include um, all the instructions and the links um, needed to, to register for the course. So as you can see on the screen, registering for the course is fairly straightforward. 
uh, you click on the course link, which is will take you to the registration page and to the bottom left hand side of the page was that pink box that was just clicked on. And once you click on that, um, it will take you to this page. Uh, once you've filled in all the required registration information, as you can see, your first name, last name, age, and so forth, um, at the bottom of the page, there is a pink box that you will see, and it says register. And you complete the information and click on that pink box, as we're doing right now. And that will complete your registration. Once you have registered, um, the course, you'll obviously be allowed to start learning and just taking it to the next page. Um, it's important remember, for you to remember that once you do register, from the date that you register, you'll have six weeks to complete the course free of charge. While we think this is plenty of time, it might be best that you identify the best period on your calendar to register so you ensure that you have plenty of time to complete the course within the six-week period. Although if uh, six weeks turns out to not be enough for you to complete the course, there is an option for learners to upgrade. And if you upgrade, um, this will mean that you receive a completion certificate and you also have access to the course for longer than six weeks. So more information on the upgrade option can be found under the extra benefits on your learner profile and the upgrade costs around 59 Australian dollars. Now the course itself has been laid out over a four week period with each week focusing on different core areas. So week one is all about setting the scene, as you can see on the page now, um, and it talks about sport, development, and change. In week two, the learner will go through the sessions on creating change. So this is about um, developing your strategy, identifying policy, and good governance. And then in week three, it's about implementation. So making it happen, making it work, and then measuring the impact. And finally, in week four, we'll cover topics including mobilizing people, partners, and resources. So each week includes things for you to read, view, listen to, and engage with, helping you to better understand sport for development policies and programs. And as Ben mentioned earlier, when putting together um, this course, the designers wanted to make sure that people could see themselves in the course and hear from a wide range of actors in the field. And as a result, when you take the course, you should be seeing and hearing familiar voices and faces, not only from the Asia Pacific region, but from around the world. So that was a very brief uh, walkthrough of what the course looks like, how to register for it, and what it actually looks like once you do register. As mentioned, though, following today's sessions, we will share via email the link to the course and information on the registration sheet. And that includes instructions to help you register and um, every information that you need uh, related to the course. So before we close off this section, um, Melissa, I understand that you've recently registered for the course. So I was wondering if you could share with us what your experience has been like and um, how you found things working through the course so far. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I am currently registered in the uh, Sport for Sustainable Development uh, Designing Effective Policies and Programs course, and we are currently at week three. Um, I'm not sure if everyone else is currently in week three, but I am currently on week three. And I think my experience and impression of the uh, course so far is that it, it is very informative um, from an uh, academic point of view, but also it is very inform informative where um, people can share their experiences. It is very open. It's a, a very welcoming uh, space for discussions. It, it, it encourages discussions from uh, participants and I think that, that it, this is really important because a lot of people uh, working in sport uh, in Asia Pacific have had to uh, learn through trial and error and learn from working on the job. And especially for something like sport uh, and development and sport for development, you know, would, you would have to go through a lot of challenges and uh, successes and failures in order to sort of figure out uh, what, what's, the, what's the right thing to do. So I think that's really, really important. That academic aspect of it is, is great because it, uh, it um, emphasizes the importance of uh, creating, designing and implementing effective policies uh, and uh, plans, uh, implementing effective plans to carry out sports for uh, de development. And I believe there is not one right way to do sports for development. 
um, uh, and, and sports and develop, development. So being able to see uh, other people's perspective, other people's challenges and how they sort of go about um, their programs and also looking at it from an ac um, academic perspective sort of brings all these things together and it starts helping participants. It, it helps me and I'm sure it's probably helping other participants to uh, formulate ideas uh, to how to go about their challenges, the best ways to work around them. Um, and you know, surprise, surprisingly for me, um, come to learn that sports for development, you know, throwing sports into community development is not always the best thing. Uh, and in learning that, we also learn the skills to sort of handle that and deal with that. And, and I guess just, you know, this course is just about giving people an idea and uh, giving people the uh, skills and the knowledge uh, to be able to use sport as a tool for development, which I am definitely looking forward to do after this course, especially uh, for uh, women in, in Vanuatu and also in the region. And, and that's just been the impression for me so far. I can't speak for everyone, but for me, this course is great. I do not have any professional or academic background in, in sport. So this is a great starting point and, and I'm looking forward to more. Excellent, thank you very much, Melissa, for sharing that and, and sharing with us the value that you've um, experienced by taking the course so far. And uh, good luck on your MOOC journey and, and completing the course. Um, now, just another reminder, uh, please feel free to share any questions you have in the chat box because we will be getting to them very shortly. Um, so please don't feel shy. We have a great um, a spectrum of, of panel members here, and I'm sure they're looking forward to answering any questions you may have of either the MOOC or, or of their experience working in the sport for development. Um, so as I mentioned, we will get to those questions shortly, but uh, just to summarize the key points that um, our speakers have, have touched on earlier. So we had, of course, Sina Millie and, and Catherine, Dr. Rowe, share on the importance of the Sport for Sustainable Development MOOC in terms of providing an accessible learning resource for those in the sport and sport for development communities and a way to, for them to develop their knowledge and their qualifications. Uh, Sina Midley highlighted that being online and, and, on, and free is a plus for many in our region who might not otherwise have the means or opportunity to benefit from learning offered through uh, the course. And Catherine pointed out that the course is also a useful way to refresh learning and allows people working in the various fields of sport for development um, to interact and learn from each other. And in the spirit of continual professional development and learning refreshment, Henry mentioned he is registered to take the course. And he also spoke of the value of the MOOC from a government and policy perspective. And he gave examples of how the MOOC could contribute to the new Vanuatu National Policy for Youth Development and Sport. And he also committed to promoting the course to the youth of Vanuatu and possibly integrating elements of the course into the school curriculum in the country. Uh, we then had Reka, Huang and, and Lua touch on the role of sport and those involved with sport, um, such as athletes, and uh, the way that sport can contribute to key development issues such as gender equity, human rights, um, safeguarding, and also obviously under the umbrella of the SDGs. Um, these are all topics that are touched on in the MOOC. Reka also touched on the importance of getting the building blocks of sport for development programming right. So sport becomes more than just participation. And she used a fantastic example of the UR program and the successes they've had in India to showcase the impact that can be achieved um, if programs are done properly. Lua shared her examples of, of work with Netball in Papua New Guinea and as an SDG champion to address water and sanitation needs. Um, her example of an athlete champion is part of a MOOC section actually on the use of athletes to add value to sport for development programs. And uh, Huang provided insight into the work of Child Fund in Vietnam and the significance of safeguarding, especially when working with children. Um, she also reflected on the impact of COVID-19 and how it has exacerbated some of the issues our sport for development programs focus on. And so it's important for programs to be able to adapt to this situation. Uh, she also added that sport will play an important role in the recovery from the pandemic and can be used to help communities adapt to the new normal. And this makes the new component of the MOOC focused on COVID-19 and sport a useful addition to the course. So uh, we thank all of our speakers for their sharing of their work and reflections on the value of the Sports for Sustainable Development course. Um, let me also remind you of the enhancements to the course that have been made for the second run based on feedback from the first run. So as just mentioned, there is now a dedicated component related to sport and COVID-19 with guidance and resources. 
There is also an improved focus on cross-cutting issues such as human rights, gender, and safeguarding. And there is an increased signposting to key initiatives, resources, and tools, including other courses. So some useful additions there made to enhance the user journey and experience. So plenty to look forward to, Melissa. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Andrew. And there is definitely plenty to look forward to. And I think one of the exciting development to keep your eye out for is that MOOC partners, the International Platform on Sport for Development, the Commonwealth Secretariat, and the Australian government are also exploring. Are also uh, explore, Are also exploring, and and that includes um, making the course accessible in other languages, uh, with a focus on other UN official languages, which are French, Spanish. Russian, Arabic, and Mandarin. So that is definitely uh, a development that you should keep your eye out for. And that is exciting as making the uh, course more accessible to everyone. If uh, English is not your first language, uh, as English is not the first language for everyone around the world, this would be a great way for other people to be able to learn about sport for development as well. Great, I'm sure that there are people who are waiting to ask their questions. Uh, our speakers have shared their experiences and given valuable viewpoints and their perspectives on the course. And I know that a lot of people are waiting to ask their questions and I'm now pleased to uh, open the floor to questions. If you have questions, please just drop them in the uh, chat, uh, in the chat box. Thank you. Melissa, I believe we've had one question um, okay. earlier from Zheng uh, and the question was, are there any passive or positive impacts on sport for development programmers implementation after the uh, UNOSDP's closure? Um, Catherine, do you mind um, taking this one if we can direct that question to you? Sure, thanks Andrew. Um, so uh, the UNOSDP stands for the United Nations Office for Sport Development and Peace. Um, that closed a couple of years ago now, from memory, two or three years ago. I could be incorrect, don't quote me on it. Um, but I, I wouldn't argue there's necessarily been positive impacts from its closure. It was a bit sad to see that particular office close because it was sort of the, the global leader or one of the biggest sort of stakeholders in an international sense in sport for development and peace. Um, but I guess even though they've closed, the UN is still quite involved directly and indirectly in sport for development. I think uh, there's quite a few stakeholders on the panel here that have probably been um, been involved uh, with the UN through their work on the ground. Um, anecdotally, I've got a colleague working over in Vietnam with the N uh, UN in Sport for Development. And then even if they don't have that office still uh, running, up and running, they have, uh, I'm sure everyone would be aware, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, which frame a whole ton of policy, uh, both locally and internationally. Um, the uh, federal government here in Australia quite often targets its policies towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and then we've seen the Commonwealth Secretariat sort of step up into that space as well. So even though there's been a bit of a space left, it's very quickly been filmed, uh, sorry, filled by other key stakeholders from a government perspective. So we've got the Commonwealth Secretariat, who've clearly been involved in this course. Um, the federal government here in Australia has also stepped up with uh, what was obviously formerly the ASPP and now Team Up. Um, Swiss Academy for De Development is another um, stakeholder I can think of off the top of my head. And then we're seeing a whole range of non-governmental organisations um, stepping up into that space and, and taking over. So you've sport, got sportanddevelopment.org. Um, they've really picked up their game over the recent years. There's been a bit of momentum in that space. And then um, a whole range of other NGOs, uh, many of which we've got representatives on, uh, on the panel here today. So yeah, I hope that answers that question. Thanks, Andrew. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. I think you've covered um, all the key stakeholders that have been working in the sport for development space and, and answered that question. I will um, also throw to Ben, um, to just share a bit of his perspective on the question. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And, and it's no doubt that the United Nations Office in Sport and Development and Peace Closure has certainly left a hole in the leadership. And Catherine mentioned some of those that are stepping up into the gap, which is great. Um, and in the Pacific, it's probably worth mentioning Sport Matters, an NGO focused on sport for development, who is leading some of the vital work regionally. 
Um, so it does require every organisation to step up, which isn't a bad thing. Um, though I do think we do need someone at that global level to help set the agenda, particularly around things like the theme and focus of major days like International Day of Sport for Development and Peace, which is on 6th of April each year. Um, and, and I can tell you that there are lots of conversations going on at the international level in the sector, um, talking about the gap that the, that the office closure has left and how we reimagine sport for development following COVID. Um, so if you have any ideas, we, we'd definitely love to hear them. Um, but it's definitely time for a reset of the sector uh, to face the post-COVID challenges, whatever they may be moving forward. Thank you, Andrew. Excellent. Thanks, Ben, um, for that additional input. Um, we have had another question popped into the chat box, and that's from Naoki, uh, Naoki Nishiyama. So thanks, Naoki, for your question, which is, how do you think we can measure the contribution of sport to the SDGs? And if there is any, any example of assessment tools or example on how this could be done, I'd love to hear that. Thank you. So that's the question for... Um, from Naoki, and maybe I'll just open it up to our panel members if they have any um, ideas to share on that question. So open to the floor for any of our panel members to jump in and answer that one. Uh, yeah, Andrew, uh, during the ACE uh, Australian Sports Outreach Program um, a few years ago, uh, we did develop uh, a monitoring and evaluation framework uh, that was um, under the leadership of the Australian Sports Commission. Uh, and uh, there were resources under the UN UNOSDP also uh, that was providing, uh, you know, clear monitoring log frames and, uh, and, and, and how to customize it to your uh, local needs. But uh, they are, they are not, uh, the resources are not there, in, to my knowledge, in one place, and they are, uh, they are sort of a bit scattered. Uh, so that's my knowledge. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Rekha, for that contribution. I'm also aware of the Commonwealth Secretariat, um, another organization working for support um, for development, is developing an SDG indicator toolkit. And I believe what they're trying to work on through that project is identifying um, certain SDGs and especially down at the indicator level and how sport um, can contribute to those SDGs and they've developed uh, several versions I believe up there up to version four of the toolkit at the moment and that is also accessible on their website the Commonwealth Secretariat website um, we'll probably include a link to that website and also rake uh, um, the tools that you've just mentioned in the poster that we'll share with all the participants um, at the end of this webinar uh, so, Naoki, thanks again for your question. Very important one about uh, measuring uh, the contribution of sport to the SDGs. Just, just on that, Andrew, um, if I can add a little bit to that, um, it's probably worth, um, there's some really great resources and information on this in the actual book. So, uh, we definitely encourage you to do that and, and get some information and resources through that. Um, Commonwealth Secretariat, as you mentioned, has some really good resources and are leading this work globally. Um, but I'd probably look at the International Platform on Sport and Development, so sportanddev.org, um, in terms of this and other areas of focus for sport for development. It has some really good resources and toolkits that you can use um, across different <laughs> aspects of sport for development. So uh, we'll pop that in the chat again. And yeah, I'd encourage everyone to have a look at a few of those sites to, to get some further information on those. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for, for the great questions and for uh, joining us today. Um, if you have any comments that you would like to share with us, please uh, email them to us after this webinar. If you have any comments, please email them to teamup at ghd.com. And thank you again for those uh, great questions. Unfortunately, we are now out of time. But before we close, I would like to thank all of our speakers for taking the time to join us today and for sharing their experiences and perspectives. Uh, the updated course was launched on 10 May and is now open. Uh, so please check it out. We have put, up, put the sign up link in the chat box for anyone interested in signing up for the second run. And if you have shared your email with us, we, we will also be sending out the course poster um, 
post our following today's uh, session, which also includes information on how you can register for the course. But once again, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us, for taking the time to join us today. Uh, enjoy your day, enjoy your night, wherever you are, whichever part of the world you're in. Enjoy your day, enjoy your night. Have a lovely afternoon from, from me and from everyone at Pema.